talking today about conversation treatment for people with aphasia, um, a randomized control trial that I've been running. Um, and I want to acknowledge my co-authors on this project, who are um, Elizabeth Hoover, who's at Boston University, and Edwin Moss, who's also at Temple University. Um, just, just some housekeeping. Um, I'm a salaried employee at Temple University, and I have no other relevant disclosures. Um, and I also want to start out by saying thank you to a whole range of people. So um, there have been a variable army of students and RAs who have been involved in this project. Um, uh, Ting Dai was involved in some very early stages. David Kaplan and Audrey Holland gave us some feedback early on. Um, and then I also want to thank the people who participated in the study and the NIDCD for very kindly funding the study. So I'm going to start out by saying something that you all know, which is that aphasia is a chronic condition. Right? So aphasia is a disorder that um, some people will show a lot of recovery, but a lot of people live with aphasia for the rest of their lives. And access to therapy is limited, um, even though we can continue to see improvements. Um, we also know that people with aphasia are at high risk for depression and anxiety, as well as for social isolation. Um, so there is some research showing that, um, I think a number of people may have heard is that social isolation is equivalent to 15 cigarettes a day, um, is something that gets bandied about. I have not been able to find the paper where people actually like did that math. Um, but it is the case that people uh, compare social isolation to um, things like cigarette smoking, obesity, um, and any number, blood pressure, all of these different kinds of things. So social isolation is a real public health concern. Um, we also know that um, there's evidence that people with aphasia um, commonly report loss of friendships um, after the onset of aphasia. So something like 30% of people with aphasia report that they have zero friends, um, I think three years after the onset of aphasia. Um, so the challenge, is twofold in my mind, that we both want to improve communication skills, but we also want to figure out how to reduce the social isolation. And so one way to do that is um, through conversation treatment. So conversation treatment, when you watch it, basically looks like people sitting around talking about topics of interest, right? Um, it's important to realize that when you're talking about conversation treatment, you're not just talking about a social group. So um, folded into the treatment, you have clinicians targeting individual goals for each group member. They're using individualized supports to support each group member. Um, I think the easiest way to figure out what conversation treatment is is to see an example. Um, so I'm going to play you a video um, of conversation treatment. So this is from one of the early sessions in our study, and the group members are talking about where they like to go in Philadelphia. I 
next. And there's a couple of things I want to highlight here. So first of all, the conversation is slower, right? Um, but you can also see that the students are doing, the student facilitators are doing a lot of different things, right? So they're engaged, but they're not really talking. Um, they're trying to maximize the um, conversational terms of the participants in the group. And they're sort of working in the background, coming up with um, multimodal communication, trying to provide supports to have the people with aphasia say what they want to say. Um, I'm going to play you another quick clip. This is from Boston. So now they're talking about where they like to go in Boston. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And again, you have the student putting materials in front of the client, but not really taking the turn, just making, giving the participant the ability to take turns and give new information. conversation treatment within principles of learning um, theory. And so for example, um, there's work from the educational literature showing that learning targets are more, most effective if they're self-selected, if they're personally relevant, and if they're easily applicable to other situations. And so one of the nice things about conversation treatment is that in contrast to much of the therapy that we do as speech language pathologists, you might propose a topic to the group members, but where they go with it from there is really up to them. It's not the case that you're presenting them with some stimulus and there's a response that you're expecting. Right? They have a lot more freedom. Um, they can talk about things that are important to them. So you have the one gentleman talking about going on a Boston Duck tour, right? people talking about things that are of interest to them. And then I would also argue that conversation is something that is easily applicable to other situations. So rather than taking naming treatments and trying to bring that into the real world, you are taking conversation, which is a lot of what we do with language, and trying to pull that into the real world. Um, people like Roberta Elman have also argued that um, you could argue for conversation treatment in terms of complexity. So the complexity account of aphasia treatment um, is the idea that you should uh, target higher level or more difficult um, structures and that those might generalize back down to simpler structures. So things like uh, treatment of underlying forms. And so the idea here is that you're treating at the discourse level and then possibly expecting generalization back down to um, more basic levels. Um, so there is reason to believe that um, you know, you can think about conversation treatment in these ways. There is some prior research on conversation treatment. Um, so studies have shown their improvement on standardized tests, so the Western Aphasia Battery Web, um, the Aphasia Quotient, um, the Paddle, the, um, what is the Paddle? Communicative Acts of Daily Living, ASHA Facts, um, and the Assessment of People Living with Aphasia, the ALA. So there is some reason to show where there's reason to believe that conversation treatment is effective. However, conversation treatment is not just one thing. So um, Nina simmons Mackey and colleagues in 2014 did a um, review of 36 studies that <coughs> claimed to be about conversation treatment and found that they differed in a whole host of ways. So whether the people in the room were professionals, were there volunteers, were there co-survivors with them, um, is the focus of the intervention individualized, problem solving, compensatory, and then the number of participants. Did you have one person with aphasia? Did you have two people with aphasia? Or did you have a group of people with aphasia? So it's unclear what the best approach to conversational treatment really is. And so what we decided to do was focus on what we thought was a pretty fundamental question, which is how many people should be in the room? So what is the optimal number of participants to have in a conversation group? 
So most studies um, have focused on larger groups, people like six to eight people. However, there is one study that's looked at individual conversation group. And there are some studies looking at dyads. However, those tend to be more like um, partner training. So having a person with aphasia paired with a co-survivor and training them in supported conversation. Or they were these cooperative learning principles that Jan even talked about. So in thinking about this, we asked the question, how do you make evidence-based decisions about the ideal number of participants? What can you think about? And we identified two literatures um, that we thought could be informative. One was the idea of group dynamics, and the other is treatment dosage. So group dynamics is a multi-dimensional theoretical framework that comes out of psychotherapy. And the idea is that there are processes inherent to large groups that are inherently beneficial for the members of the group. This comes out of uh, psychotherapy, like I said, and there are meta-analyses showing that individual psychotherapy and group psychotherapy can both be equally as effective. And these are some of the reasons why this has been proposed in the psychological literature. So the idea is that you bring together people who have similar interests or problems, the members are able to share resources with each other and gain support. Um, it reduces social isolation because you're meeting people who have the same kinds of impairments as you do. You realize you're not alone in it. And then my personal favorite for aphasia groups is this idea of vicarious and interpersonal learning. So the idea that if you have multiple people with aphasia in the same room, um, you, you know, as the speech pathologist, you can suggest that people, you know, write something down. You can pass the paper, but I think that that suggestion has more credibility when it's coming from another person with aphasia who uses that strategy effectively, right? When it's someone else with aphasia pushing, you know, giving you the piece of paper or asking you to draw, it has a different kind of meaning, and also you can see someone with aphasia using gestures to communicate information and realize, oh, this is a way I can bring new ideas to this conversation. So the idea here is there are all of these group dynamics. Um, you can also think about group dynamics from a more specific CSD perspective or communication sciences and disorders. So you can think about the idea that groups offer a greater variety of communicative functions or speech acts. So you have different people who are using different kinds of speech acts. You get a range of models, so a greater diversity of models of communication. And then also you get to practice turn taking in a more complex environment, right? If you're in a group of people and you're trying to get in to the conversation, that can be very challenging for people with aphasia. So these are reasons why you might think a group is a good idea. But um, as we were thinking about this, we realized that this idea of group dynamics conflicted with the idea of treatment intensity. Because if you're in a group, you're going to have in some ways less treatment intensity than you do if you're only with the clinician or with another person who has aphasia. So treatment intensity is something that gets talked about in physiology reasonably often, right? Treatment intensity includes both the amount of treatment within a given period and the number of practice trials. So here we're thinking about a practice trial as a conversational turn. So each time you get to take a conversational turn, that's a practice trial. So if you're in a large group, you're going to have less practice than if you're having a conversation in a smaller group. Um, there's, like I said, evidence that increasing dosage improves learning, even when the number of sessions is controlled. Um, also, Lior Charity has done some of this work, looking at intensity and showing that basically more treatment is better. Um, what's nice about this model, or what we're doing here, is that we can manipulate group dynamics and dosage without, um, we can manipulate dosage without manipulating amount of treatment. So, the way that we did this is by looking at conversation treatment in large groups of six to eight people and um, conversational dyads, where there are two individuals with aphasia. The reason that we decided to go with dyads instead of individual conversation treatment is because we wanted to have the peer-to-peer -peer conversational turns between people with aphasia. And also, we thought that if you had a clinician and a person with aphasia that the person with aphasia may rely more on 
the clinician to support the conversation, and we wanted the clinician to be there mostly as a facilitator, not as a supportive conversation partner. But what this lets us do is control, right? So the dyads and the groups are gonna have the same amount of treatment, they have the same number of treatment sessions, but within that, the dyads have a greater treatment intensity because they have more practice sessions, whereas in a larger group, you have the benefits of group dynamics, but fewer practice terms. So just to summarize, um, we, um, what we're looking at here is a phase one randomized controlled trial. We're looking at <coughs> conversation treatment in large groups, which we're defining as six to eight people with aphasia, and dyads, which is two people with aphasia. And the group dynamics hypothesis predicts that you're going to see better outcomes in the group than in the dyad. Whereas the treatment dosage hypothesis predicts that you're going to have better outcomes in the dyads than in the groups. So what did we actually do? Um, this is the whole figure of the pattern of what happened when we recruited. Um, in words, we recruited 24 people at each of two sites, so Temple University and Boston University. And they were randomly assigned to the group dyad, group condition, dyad condition, or a delay control condition. Um, dyads were matched to each other after random assignment. So we wanted to try to keep it clinically feasible, and we didn't really think that clinicians would just randomly put people together. So once we had the eight people to be put in the dyads, we used our intuitions of who would get along and whose schedules worked together and paired them up. Um, and so what we ended up with after attrition is 11 people in our large group, 16 people in the dyads, and 14 in the delay control group. This, is, um, a fig this table shows um, age and education across groups, um, just to show that they were randomized. Um, um, and we also had a range of aphasia types. So our inclusion criteria were fairly minimal. We were looking at uh, people who had, um, as long as they had sufficient um, auditory comprehension to follow the conversation, and if we diagnosed them as having aphasia, they were included. So we have a range of aphasia types across the different groups. Our assessment protocol, um, we had, so our primary outcome measure was percent um, correct information units, and we took those from uh, three speech samples that we collected following the aphasia bank protocol. So we had the stroke story, the Nicholas and Brookshire cat rescue picture, so this is the <coughs> cat in the tree, and everybody's favorite, the Cinderella story. Um, and then we also had a battery of standardized tests. So the comprehensive aphasia test is a standardized battery that um, takes a psycholinguistic approach to evaluating aphasia. And we administered all of the subtests except for the writing subtests. So we have um, written and spoken comprehension, naming, and we also have picture description. Um, we also did the Northwestern um, Assessment of Verbs and Sentences, the Sentence Production Priming Test. This is where you show people a picture, give them a sentence with a structure, and then ask them to produce a sentence with a similar structure about another picture. Um, the verb naming test to get a measure of uh, verb naming, action naming. And then we also administered the short forms of the Philadelphia naming test. We also had two patient reported outcome measures. The first is the adaptive aphasia communication outcome measure, the ACOM. Um, this is a sample item, so you're asked questions like, how effectively do you talk about your day with family or friends? And the person with aphasia has to answer either completely, mostly, somewhat, not very, or doesn't apply to me. And if they say it doesn't apply to them, they're taken to another screen where they're asked if that's because of their aphasia or for some other reason. Um, we did the adaptive um, version, which is uh, 12 items, and it's sort of like the GREs where each, like your response to each item determines what item you're going to see next in order to get a standardized score. 
And then we also administer the Lubin Social Network Scale. This is a scale that's commonly used in psychology and in social work to measure social isolation. So we used a short form of this as well because we were interested in um, testing burden. And so there are six questions here, um, three about family and three about friends. And they ask questions like, how many relatives or friends do you see or hear from at least once a month? How many relatives do you feel close enough that you can talk about private matters? And how many relatives or friends do you feel close enough to that you could ask them for help? We did modify this a little bit from the standard administration in that we would read the questions to the people with aphasia, and if they weren't sure what any of the words meant, we would explain it to them. In terms of timeline, um, I'm going to be talking about testing from three time points. So the first assessment was pre-treatment, then there was a treatment phase. Assessment two was immediately post-treatment, there was a six-week delay, and then um, a maintenance testing. We also actually did test the maintenance um, 11 months out, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I can if you have questions. Um, so, conversation treatment. So one of the big challenges we had is how do you formalize something that's unstructured by definition. We needed to be able to administer conversation treatment in such a way that you could have it replicated by people who were reading the paper later, but also that it would be similar enough between Boston University and Temple University and between the groups and the dyads. So what we ended up doing was we have this like we build a scaffold and let nature take its course. So the basic protocol was that we met twice per week for 10 weeks for one hour session. So there were 20 hours of treatment. Um, all of the clinicians were um, underwent a uh, online training together, so all of the students received training together. Um, and then we had um, some sort of basic things, so you know the clinicians were trying to equalize number of conversational turns. Um, group members were never required to talk, but we would invite them to talk. Um, there are certain supports that were always available each session, so pens, papers, maps, picture dictionaries, and an iPad or laptop as a digital librarian. And then the clinicians also modeled use of strategies. So um, the clinicians either used gestures or wrote keywords at least twice per session, and they also found information on the computer at least once per session. And there were undergraduates um, observing all the groups who were tallying all this. So undergraduates were, were tallying every time somebody took a conversational turn, and then they were also tallying every time somebody used multimodal com um, communication strategies. And the reason that we have the mo modeling use of strategies was because we wanted to normalize them and show how you could use these strategies to communicate. We generated a list of five sort of general topics and then we cycled through them twice over the course of treatment. So week one and week six, we talked about personal history, so we talked about family and hometowns. Um, the first week and the first two sessions, and then week six, we talked about education, occupation, vocation, and hobbies and interests. Um, we talked about travel, so transportation, a kind of routing conversation about public transportation in Philadelphia. Um, what sites to see in Boston and Philadelphia. Um, we talked about um, food that travels, which is another surprisingly rising conversation. <laughs> and uh, holiday food, which was fun. And then the students um, took turns generating materials. So um, they had uh, PowerPoints that had questions and visual aids. So this is one for favorite places in Philadelphia. Um, these are foods you might give as gifts. And then there were also external aids. So this was when we were talking about jobs. We had pages from a picture dictionary that were available that we printed out in both locations. So all of the groups and all of the dyads had the same materials in front of them. Um, these were some of the materials for holiday foods. And so in addition to all of this, um, we also had individualized goals for each participant. So each person in the group or in the dyad had two individualized goals that were based on their pre-treatment testing and on conversation with them about what it was they wanted to work on. Um, so these were some of the examples. Um, so produce grammatical SEO sentences in discourse given a verbal or visual 
queue, independently producing keywords and discourse, reduce the use of inappropriate temporal markers given a verbal or visual cue, produce uh, personally relevant ideas using multimodal communication, um, decrease production of filler words and revisions in discourse given a visual cue. So you can see that we have a really wide range here, right? From people trying to produce grammatical sentences to people where really our focus is on communicating ideas by any means necessary. And these were rated um, after each session on a Likert scale to indicate how the people were doing. Um, in many of these cases, you see uh, that we were using visual cues. So, for example, we had one uh, person in the group who tended to start every sentence with the word yesterday, which can be very confusing. And so we had a visual cue for this person that was a card that had the word yesterday with a big red X on it. And so this would get folded into the session. So when they were talking, if the person started a sentence with yesterday, the student might, you know, sort of like gesture towards the card. Another time, um, she might ask, was it yesterday? So trying to, you know, in the context of conversation, target these various goals. All right, so I like videos, so I think I have to watch another one. So I mean, the video I'm going to show you now, I'm showing it to you for two reasons. So first of all, maybe three. The first one is I like it. Um, <laughs> The second reason is because this is the same group I showed you earlier talking about Philadelphia, but this is from the very end. And so I think that this really shows you what group dynamics do because you will see that at this point it looks like people sitting down at like family dinner. There, It's a very different mood in the room. Um, and then also because I think it demonstrates a lot of the kinds of um, ways that we're communicating in group. Um, to set the stage here, um, this gentleman who's back here looking at um, was uh, trying, they were talking about travel and he was trying to say where he was um, stationed when he was in the army, in the navy. And um, he, in trying to say it, he made a really large gesture which resulted in coffee spilling everywhere. And so the coffee has been cleaned up and I've just come back in and began to see. Um, a ladder or something that you can um, 
So at this point, the student decides to try something else, but you're looking at a level up on the hierarchy. So instead of just entering search terms into the computer, the group member is being asked what terms should she search for. was um, this thing that we assumed that the groups would um, have fewer conversational terms than the dialogues. Is it true? Um, and the answer is yes. So what you're looking at here is the number of conversational terms separately for Boston and Temple, for the dyads, and for the groups. And um, but you can just, it's a significant difference, but you can just see it, that the people in the dyads have considerably more conversational terms. I particularly like that at Boston, the highest number of terms taken by somebody in a group is still lower than the smallest number of conversational terms somebody ever had in the dyad, right? Um, there's also this um, weird thing where we seem to have more conversational terms at Temple than in Boston. Um, I'm not sure what that is. That could be that we count conversational terms slightly, you're counting slightly differently, or it could be that people in Philadelphia take slightly shorter conversational terms. <laughs> um, but it definitely uh, supported our assumption that the number of practice trials or treatment dosage was higher in the dyads than the groups. So turning first to our primary outcome measure, which was percent correct information units. Um, just to orient you to what you're looking at, so you have the delayed control group, the dyads, and the large group condition at pre-treatment, post-treatment, and six weeks post-treatment. Um, and basically there's nothing here. So sadly, our primary outcome measure did not show any significant changes. And this is the average of the Cinderella retail, the cat picture, and the cat rescue picture. Um, so, I'm going to move on to our secondary outcome measures. And um, so I wanted to show you two things here. Um, so this is all of the results. I'm going to talk you through the ones that are important. So <laughs> I show you this to make two points. Um, the first is that um, there are some, so the things that are highlighted in yellow, I don't know if you can really tell this difference on the screen, but things that are in yellow are significant at 0.05. Um, and things that are highlighted in green, which I think is not showing up, um, survived a home correction. So, um, and we were only looking at things that survived a home correction for multiple comparisons. Um, a home correction, if you don't know, is like a slight, it's a less conservative version of a von Peroni correction. So I show you this um, in part to make the point that there are some significant changes for the delay control group before the Bonferroni correction, or before the home correction. And um, so in the uh, interest of transparency, I do want you to know that. Um, but what I'll do now is talk about um, the significant results that we found that did survive the home correction. So here are results from the comprehensive aphasia test from the repetition um, section and the naming section. And the repetition section um, includes repetition of words, non-words, sentences, and digits. And so here, there was a significant difference in the dyads from um, time one to time two and from time one to time three. And there were no other significant differences. 
in the naming, so cat naming includes verbal fluency, object naming, and a couple of action, um, action naming, I think four. And here we saw significant changes from time one to time two or pre to post treatment in both the dyad and the large group conditions, but those weren't maintained at six weeks follow up. These are the cat picture descriptions total score. So the picture description on the cat, the scoring method um, is uh, ICWs or information carrying words. And what it includes is appropriate and inappropriate words. These are counted slightly different from correct information units, but they're sort of analogous. You can think about them similarly. And then also incorporates ratings of speed, grammatical correctness, and range of syntactic structures. So it's a pretty comprehensive measure. And here, what we found is a significant difference from time one for pre-treatment to post-treatment in the large group, which was maintained at six weeks follow-up, and nothing else was significant here. So even though this looks like something, it is not significant. Um, for the verb gaming test, we found a significant change from pre to post-treatment for the dyads only, and no other significant differences. And then finally, for the Adaptive Aphasia Communication Outcome Measure, the ACOM, um, we found changes for the large group from pretreatment to post-treatment. Um, it didn't quite survive the home correction at six weeks, um, and no other significant differences. So, to summarize, because I realize that was a lot of things. <laughs> um, for the delay control group, there were no changes that survived the home correction. For the dyads, we saw improvements on the verb naming test, cat repetition, and cat naming. And for the large groups, we saw improvements on cat naming, the cat picture description, and the ACOM. So, what do we make of all this? So, the first point here is that we did not see a change in our primary outcome measure. Right? So, I want to acknowledge that. Um, However, we did see that conversation treatment was associated with treatment gains in other measures. Um, and so we would argue that these results are supportive of conversation treatment, um, consistent with previous studies. Um, the delay control group didn't show any significant changes. The, both the dyads and the large group did show treatment changes. Um, this was a phase one study, so part of what we're doing is trying to figure out what are the appropriate outcome measures. So in thinking about outcome measures, um, so something that we've thought a lot about, um, and so one of the questions is philosophically, what is it that we're interested in, right? So there are standardized tests, which, you know, things like naming and like sort of more discrete language tasks, naming, repetition, comprehension. Um, there's discourse measures, so there's things like correct information units, which didn't show anything, but then there's the ICWs, which did seem to show something. And then there are patient reported outcome measures, which um, don't necessarily go with either of those, um, but show us what the person with aphasia thinks. Right? What does the person with aphasia think is happening to their own communication? So I find that I'm left in, I, I don't have an answer to this question. I'd be happy to hear your ideas um, and opinions and thoughts. But it's very hard for me to decide and think about whether, as a primary outcome measure, I would pick a patient-reported subjective outcome measure, like the ACOM, or a discourse measure. Right? Um, because people might perceive changes that aren't there objectively, and what do you make of that? So this is one thing we've wondered quite a bit about. Um, another thing that we've been spending a fair bit of time on is looking at different discourse measures to try to figure out if there is one that's sensitive to treatment changes. So when we don't see a change in the correct information units, the question is, does the treatment not work, and so it didn't make a change, or is it the case that the outcome measure was wrong, that it was an insensitive outcome measure? 
So one of the things that we did is um, start to look at ICWs because we did find significant effects there. And so, but that was only on one picture. So the question becomes, well, is that just a fluke that we're just seeing it on the one thing? Or is it the case that um, ICWs are more sensitive because it's a more comprehensive measure? And so where we started with this is with the Cinderella story. And um, we had to modify the analyses to analyze the Cinderella story. Um, and I'm happy to talk about um, how we did that. But these are data just from Temple. Um, so this is half the data. I haven't analyzed anything statistically because it's half the sample is missing. But I find it pretty promising that just looking at the graphs, they look a lot like the ICW graphs for the cat rescue for the cat standardized test picture. Right? So I don't know if these are significant. I don't know if like the delay control group is going to turn out to be significant this time, but I at least find it sort of comforting that we're seeing a similar pattern at this point. So this is one way that we're going, an avenue that we're pursuing to try and figure out what is the best primary outcome measure. And I know that you all have thought a lot about discourse measures as well, so again, um, I'm really interested in your input. Our larger question was between group dynamics and treatment dosage. Right, so what is the effective group size? And when we got our results, what we realized was that we'd asked too simple a question. So in the predictions, I said, are you going to see better outcomes for the group or the dyad? The answer turns out to be yes, um, because, but on different kinds of measures. So when you look at more discrete language tasks, repetition, verb naming, we saw more improvements in the dyads. But when you look at the discourse measures and the patient reported outcome measures, where we see changes is in the large groups. So it seems that you might have, you know, where you're going to see the improvements is going to differ depending on how big the group is and what the treatment dosage is. There are other considerations between um, groups and dyads. So one issue is just cost. We live in an era of cost accountability. And if it's going, if it turns out that large groups are as efficient as individual or dyadic treatment, there might be reason to go with the large group treatment. Um, however, something we've also been thinking about is whether this would differ across aphasia profiles. So it might be that the interaction between group dynamics and dosage differs as a function of group size. So it could be that people who are more severely impaired might do better in dyads. Maybe they would do better in a large group. This is an open question, but I think it's something that we need to keep thinking about. Um, another consideration that really struck me when I was looking at our data um, was about attendance. Um, so, we looked at the attendance across the dyads and the large groups and Boston and Temple. And there are no significant differences here, but there are two things I want to talk about. So the first is that on average, the dyads always had better attendance than the large groups. And we think that this is for two reasons. First of all, with the dyads, if you had warning, you could reschedule for another time because there's just two of them in the large group. You can't reschedule a large group because one person can't be there. Um, but also we thought that in the dyads there was greater accountability between the partners. So if you're one of eight people, it might be easier to not show up one day versus if you're one of two people. The other thing that stands out to me here is that the attendance at Boston University was much better than the attendance that we had at Temple University. And here is a place where I think a lot about the demographics. So when we look at the demographics of our groups, um, in Boston, a lot of the people were driving to the group sessions. In Philadelphia, many of our group members were traveling two hours by public transportation, where they were taking paratransit, which is um, like, the, uh, like a bus will come to the person's house. And paratransit is known to sometimes just not show up. Um, sometimes they would be 40 minutes late. 
Um, one time recently, um, somebody's ride came to pick them up before they'd actually been dropped off. So, um, the part of, I think, what goes into this then is just how people are able to access treatment and how people's demographic factors work into that. And so I think that's something else that we need to think about when we're planning our programs. So to conclude, um, I think the conversation treatment is associated with positive treatment effects. Um, I think that depending on what you want to change, there's probably a group for that. So I think large groups are more likely to um, be associated with changes at the discourse level and people's own perceptions. I think that dyads might be more likely to change um, discrete language tasks. And I think that choosing outcome measures is a challenge. And obviously this is an area that um, we need to do more work in to figure out the answer. Um, and so to end, I'm going to end with my how do you capture this. So this is um, a video at the end of um, the dyads um, for one of our dyads. take questions first from the audience here and then follow up with questions from the online audience and if you could just um, wouldn't mind repeating the question uh, so that everyone can hear appropriately and one thing I forgot to mention is that there will be another C star lecture next week on the 9th and that'll be uh, Professor Benia from Medical University of South Carolina so he'll be here but for now questions I have a couple of questions and a couple of thoughts that I would like to share with you after this, but you had mentioned that you match the participants based on um, how available they were on when they could be scheduled and stuff like that for the dyads. Did you match them on severity too, or like a phasia type or anything like that? Not um, overtly. So we used our clinical judgment. So I think that overall the dyads ended up being more matched than the group. In our large group, we definitely had people who were very severely something changed. I'm just gonna change the screen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we had people who were very severely impaired and people who were very mildly impaired in the large group. In the dyads, it tended to be um, a little bit closer. Okay. And then my second question. So you said that um, the topics were rotated throughout, right? You talked mm -hmm. about the same topic after a few weeks mm -hmm. of talk, okay. Could you possibly look at the first time they talked about this topic and the second time and comparing their discourse kind of in that way? Yeah, so we have talked about um, looking at, sorry, I'm distracting from these comments. <laughs> 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 um, we've definitely talked about analyzing some of the data from the conversation treatment itself, even like within topics or looking from the beginning to the end of treatment to look at, to look at those actual conversations. Um, I feel like I could probably analyze these data for the rest of my life. At some point we calculated that we had like, somewhere close to a thousand speech samples and it's a three year grant. So, <laughs> um, so I don't know if we will do that, but it's something we've spoken about doing. <laughs> And it would be interesting. It's just time, of course. So we struggle with many of the same things that you mentioned, as far as you know, what are you trying to get out of discourse and reliability on, on measuring discourse samples and that kind of thing. Um, what about? And one thing that I'm really interested in is is the whole how does communication effect, effectiveness in general improve? And so you're using the ACOM. We've used the ACOM as well. Um, you know, we've even talked about getting input from um, family members. Mm -hmm. uh, have you guys done anything like that? We have not. We've also <laughs> talked about doing that. Um, so you might, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I did forget. So the question is, um, have we considered looking at including family ratings um, to see if 
we see changes there, um, and we haven't. Um, one reason that we didn't do that is because um, we were, in, at least at Temple, we, we, all, we don't have very many caregivers who are involved, and so we were worried that we just wouldn't have the data. Um, but it is something that we're thinking about moving forward. Uh, the question that I thought you were going to ask me but didn't was about integrating nonverbal communication mm -hmm. and how that fits into it. And so one of the things, I have a student who looked at uh, the use of enactment before and after treatment, looking at how people, um, so enactment is the sort of like directed speech where you take on the role of somebody in the discourse. So. Um, you have all seen people with aphasia do this a million times, right? Instead of saying the dog is barking, they say bark, 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 right? To convey the same information. And she did find that over time the amount of enactment increased, that it increased more in the treatment groups, and that it was the same people using more enactment as well as new people starting to use enactment. So some indication that that's not even really nonverbal, it was all verbal, but it's mm -hmm. another way of communicating that's not captured in a lot of these measures. So I, I think there's a lot of ways you can look at this. Mm -hmm. Measurement is a black hole. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I do have I do <laughs> So um, can you tell us a little bit about why you selected CIUs as your outcome measure, as your primary outcome measure? Um, so the question is why CIUs? Um, and the answer is partly for comparability to other studies um, and partly for, I think, feasibility because it seemed easier than doing something like QPA or another like, really detailed grammatical level analysis. Um, and also because we were interested in the efficiency, so we thought that maybe we would see a change in how efficiently people were able to communicate information across time. So that's why we started out with CIUs. Um, I think, uh, like Dan said, there's a lot of challenges in terms of um, getting reliability in CIUs. And um, yeah, it can be, it's, it's a challenging kind of analysis. The reason why I ask that is because what seems to be a bit to be really special about what you're doing is that you're focusing on conversation. Mm -hmm. But CIU is not really a conversational measure per se. So I expected that you would have maybe something that would be more focused on, you know, how would this person do if they met a stranger on the street. Not that that is easy, but I, I you know. Yeah, you know no, I mean? you're absolutely right. And so these are all the kinds of things we're talking about as we're moving forward. But as you say, doing conversational analysis is a whole other level of complexity, and it's not an easy sort of analysis to do. It's not, so that's where we thought about looking at like, the first treatment session and the last treatment session, where you would be confounding a number of things, but where you would have a general sense of how does this person engage in conversation at the very beginning of treatment and the very ending. Have you done conversational analysis that you found? That we think is like the magic bullet? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, just looking at lexical items in conversation, I think we get really nice results with that in our treatment studies. But looking at grammatical measures, you know, it's not sure. No. What sort? So, um, just like the correct, uh, the number of uh, correct words per minute. Things like that, we did mm -hmm. a definite increase even in our smaller sample, mm -hmm. uh, decrease in semantic and phonological errors, even though that's not huge, but the trend is certainly there. Um, those kinds of measures. And you see it in conversation, but not in the No, just, just in, the, in the discourse measures. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that reminds me, I have another question for you. Your discourse measures and your measures in general. Are your outcome raters blinded at all? Um, we weren't able to blind them officially, just due to resource limitations. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer to that is no, we did not do that on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, they were mostly um, 
the scoring was done based on like uh, de-identified like data numbers, and they didn't necessarily know where or when that was coming from. Mm -hmm. But they could have inferred that they this is before it is after. Um, I had a question kind of about generalization. Mm -hmm. um, so I know you said the student clinicians in these therapy sessions are mostly um, like sign them multimodal mm -hmm. kind of communication and um, like looking things up for when they needed to. But um, did they ever, I feel like um, when they encounter with strangers are other people who don't have aphasia, like it's very fast paced and like did in these therapy sessions did like take time to discuss like what's my strategies or disclosure statements kind of thing or yeah. yeah. So do you mind the Oh sorry, so the question I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, a lot of interested people so Yes. So the better. question was um, did we ever do sort of direct teaching about compensatory strategies and saying you know you might use this or disclosing that you have aphasia. And the answer is no, we didn't do that. Um, we were really focused on conversation and improving conversation, and that was the focus. Um, this is great, thank you. So I'm thinking a lot about our future group that we lead here, mm -hmm. and um, thinking about two pieces in terms of, with our group, a lot of the participants have been coming for years and years, they're paired with a lot of the same individuals. Mm -hmm. So there's that element of familiarity. So my first question is, have these people been attending groups at either Temple or Boston before doing the conversation treatment? Mm -hmm. And the second part of my question relates to those who are participating in conversation therapy, but perhaps more passively due to their language impairment or personality or they're just a more passive person. Mm -hmm. And what your thoughts are in accounting for that in their language change and looking at that as participating, but less verbally. Right. Okay, so the first question was how many of these participants had previously been involved in the groups and received conversation treatment. Um, we didn't look at that, we haven't looked at that formally. Um, it, we didn't require that people be new. So mm -hmm. some of the people had been in treatment, had been in conversation groups before. Um, our rationale for that is that we think that conversation treatment has ongoing benefits and so you could still see changes over this period. Um, the, I believe that the evidence, you know, for group dynamics, the idea is that every group is different. Right? Even if you just change the facilitators, mm -hmm. the dynamic of the group changes. And certainly these were groups of people that had never been together before in this way. So I don't know that familiarity in that sense would have really made a difference. Some of the people did know each other, but not all. Um, so I think that that familiarity can help, mm -hmm. but I also think that adding in new people sort of reduces that a little bit. Uh, the second question was? Someone who's perhaps more quiet, and whether quiet, that's yes. <laughs> more personality. Yeah, so the question was people who tend to be more passive or quiet in group, how does that affect what they're getting out of group? So in the context of a large group, I think that's where things like vicarious learning and support and confidence building can come into play. So you can have all of those benefits without ever having to say a word. So there's that. The other piece of it, though, is that we did try to encourage people to participate in the conversation. So if you know someone who was quieter, we might direct a question to them, or we would look for nonverbal cues that they had a, you know, something they wanted to say and try to clear out a space in front of them, for, you know, try to make a space for them to have their conversational turn. So we tried to get people to engage as best we could, but even with that, there are definitely some people who talk more as in any group, and you know, people who talk a lot more and people who talk a lot less. And that was, you know, definitely apparent in the groups. Um, I think if we had, one of the things, again, as we move forward that we're interested in doing is looking at those kinds of questions. How does the number of conversational terms that an individual took relate to their changes over time? How does attendance relate to changes over time? All those kinds of questions. Questions there? 
Um, my question is also related to uh, uh, perhaps incarnation units. Mm -hmm. uh, are these units like um, defined as semantically or grammatically? Um, semantically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so correct information units are words that are correct and relevant in context. Were these like easy to uh, uh, cars to code? Uh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> correct information units, there's a paper by um, Nicholas and Brookshire from 93 where there is this very detailed appendix in probably six point font uh, <laughs> that has more detail than uh, you would ever want um, in how to code correct information units and somehow it's still not enough. Questions here? So if you can, I don't know if you can click on the chat box and you can actually show a question. Oh, so is it that? So if you <laughs> yeah, okay. Do I need to try to go up or down or anything? Or? Just, just all at the bottom. Oh, okay. There's a question. There is a question. Now I can't get to it because I'm on the way. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> 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 so it's the worst thing I've ever done. Okay, yeah. So we have a question, of, how do you think the results might change if there were additional sessions, two 10-week sessions in a year instead of just one 10-week session? That's a good question, um, that's sort of a treatment intensity question. Um, if you have more treatment sessions, will you see greater changes? Um, I don't know the answer to that, we didn't look. I think that at some level, I think, you know, more is always better. Um, though my own results might argue against that. Uh, I think that, um, the, the other issue that we thought about a fair bit when we were designing this study was, again, thinking about what's clinically realistic. Um, a lot of treatment studies the amount of time you spend on one specific treatment is really unrealistic for what you might expect to see people, clinicians doing in the real world. And I will cheerfully admit that two hours of treatment for 10 weeks on the same, the, the same kind of treatment is still sort of falls into that camp, but we didn't want to have, you know, five hours of treatment a week for six months to, and, you know, use that as our measure. We wanted to look at something that was Closer to clinical feasibility. I think that's the only question. Oh, okay. So yeah. Unless there's any other questions, I think we should just thank you. Thank you.